Um, we're now ready to resume the program. You've already heard me talk, so I'm not going to talk much longer. I'm just going to introduce Malini Venkata Subramanian, who is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and is going to be talking about a joint project with Alfred Copes and others um, on privacy in IoT based devices. So I'm um, curious about hearing about my doorbell. <laughs> Or about your Wi-Fi, right? <laughs> Doorbell. <laughs> no, Wi-Fi. So, um, hi, my name is Nalini Venkata Subramanian, and I'm a faculty here in the Department of Computer Science. Um, I, I don't think the mic's Oh, my mic's not on? Yes. Is that better? Yes. 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 Yeah, okay. Hi. So, uh, over the years, we've been looking at um, what I would call instrumented smart spaces in many different types of settings. Um, for example, this building and about a third of campus was instrumented about 10 years ago with a variety of different types of sensing and networking and communication technologies, primarily for the purpose of, for example, looking at um, new technologies for emergency response. And over the years, we have sort of expanded the gamut of technologies that we have deployed in these spaces and um, used it for many different purposes. You know, things get bad, things die, we have replaced these things. but. Today, um, we've applied, you know, we've brought in new types of devices, including energy harvesting technologies. We've brought in different types of mobile apps and mobile phones. We've applied it to looking at resilience in cyber physical systems. Today, the, the word of the day, as most of us sort of look at, is the Internet of Things. And really, what this enables us or to do is to provide, in some sense, um, a very large number of cheap devices that are brought into the space organically, being able to interconnect them for the purpose of a variety of applications. So um, the Internet of Things at some level, most of us have heard about it, and I've looked at all the Gartner Group reports that talk about how many billion devices are going to be out there. Um, one report says we're going to have about a trillion by next decade, and this is going to generate very large amounts of data and data flow that comes through these devices into you know, cloud computing infrastructures, edge infrastructures, and being used for a variety of applications. If you look at a common pattern in all of these different types of infrastructures and devices, the idea is that what these enable us to do is to take physical spaces and create some approximate representation in the digital world of that physical space through observation technologies, right? That's what a lot of sensors do. So this idea of looking at these observe, analyze, adapt, or act loops over time, over spaces, for different types of applications is really the running theme of how do I enable these observe, analyze, adapt loops that allow us to observe events, people's actions, situations, uh, generate meaningful situational awareness out of that, and be able to use that for manipulating decision support as well as drive different types of adaptations whether it's changing the temperature or the lighting, for example, in a building. Okay? So uh, we'll talk about this observe, analyze, adapt loops, but these are examples of different, uh, as we move forward, and its connection to privacy, and in particular to this building, as we move on. But here are examples of smart space artifacts and uh, artifacts that we have developed. So as I told you, we had this, we have created this test bed over the years. It's called <coughs> It was called response sphere as a sphere of activity dedicated to crisis response. You know, we have an emergency. We can't exactly test by creating an emergency. We, we got to mimic it, and we got to have it in a test bed. We can't go to you know, first responders and say, here's my new protocol, networking protocol. Can you test it for me? So this was our test bed to do that. Today, that uh, same test bed is called the Irvine Sensorium. We've applied it for the fire practice for, um, you know, um, soldiers on the field kind of applications. We've looked at different types of data coming from video data to speech data to looking at even other types of sensor data for things. This is a you know, project that we did with Gloria Mark, who's in informatics, uh, looking at recycling of styrofoam cups, for example, in the Cal ID2 building several years ago. The more recent uh, effort that we have looked at in this space is uh, Project that is actually a very interesting project. We had a lot of experience with test beds, so about a year, two, two and a half years ago, they invited some folks to a uh, White House um, NIST effort, which essentially said, hey, you all have built test beds. Why don't you put your uh, technologies together and show us what the Internet of Things can do 
in six months. And the scale project with about uh, six partners here grew out of that. So what we did was to instrument a low-income housing facility in Montgomery County, Maryland, with a variety of cheap IoT sensors. And the key idea here is that the Internet of Things is not just for people who can afford it and who can who have the technology wherewithal to be able to manipulate it and know how to set up their networks, but to be accessible for everyone, everywhere, and at low cost. And so and this is a senior living facility where, you know, think of a person living alone on a, wheel, on a wheelchair. The idea was we instrumented the space, instrumented the person with a bunch of sensor or devices, IoT, cheap IoT devices, Raspberry Pis, think of, um, you know, cheap $5, $10 sensors off of the internet. The data goes from these devices through multiple networks, including very cheap, what we call ultra narrow band networks to a county office from where we partnered with IBM to create this, you know, IoT data analytics in the cloud. The key idea is because these are cheap sensors, they don't work so well after a while. So we had a third party phone service actually if the person fell down, for example, to be able to call back the person to say, hey, did you fall down? Hey, did you actually leave your gas stove on? And if there was a confirmation or if there was uh, help that was anticipated, that would go to a dashboard <coughs> in the fire station. So this loop was actuated and enabled very quickly. The question is there are resilience issues and privacy issues that are naturally come into the picture over here. This project now has grown to a next level of the project scale too. We went from six to 26 partners and we're now implementing it in multiple cities, not just in the US but around the world as well. We're looking at different problems. Today I'm going to talk about a smaller aspect of it. We're going to bring it down to the level of a building. You know, building management systems, in particular, we're going to talk about this building, Red Hall. Okay, building management systems have been around for a while. They can be thought of as cyber physical systems that allow us to observe what's going on in a building, manage these buildings and services um, to do a bunch of different things, such as manage the electricity supply, do HVAC and lighting control, do um, information about providing uh, better services for folks such as, you know, uh, fire sa safety related services, special needs services. Um, almost every entry and exit in the public spaces of this building is instrumented with audiovisual sensing. So for example, we were partnering in this case with Honeywell to instrument this very building with a whole bunch of new types of IoT devices and sensors. So this is obviously good because we can improve sustainability, we can improve safety. This is a new opportunity provides, you know, and this new trend is also the idea that people are coming in now with variety of devices. You know, I have my Fitbit, I have different types of devices that I have on me. Can I combine this individual centric data, the data coming from indiv individuals entering the space, living in the space, um, conducting activities and processes in the space with other types of instrumented in situ building data in order to address new opportunities. The idea is that this ability to instrument new opportunities may also lead to other unanticipated challenges. In particular, we'll talk about privacy. And we'll talk about privacy, but all of this stuff comes at the cost of you know, both security and privacy, and I'd like to distinguish between the two here. So security in this case says that you know new devices, I don't know who's manufacturing it, increases the attack surface and new types of vulnerabilities come into the picture. However, uh, the privacy situation says that these sensors may be highly granular. They may capture information about where you are, what you're doing, how long you've been somewhere, who else you've been with, and may capture other aspects that you know people often consider private. So the question is, as I start instrumenting these spaces and humans with these technologies to provide benefits, what are the downsides? And can I actually achieve the benefits that I want without actually incurring some of the downsides? And that's really what this new project called TIPPERS is about. Uh, it stands for Testbed for IoT-based long name, Privacy Preserving Pervasive Spaces. It is a DARPA-funded project where uh, we at the University of California at ICS are working with Honeywell Research to instrument this building with a whole bunch of new types of devices and sensors that we're going to try to look at two types of situations. We have building management systems out there. Can I think of privacy as a retrofit? Okay, What can I do to enable these different types of applications that people would want to instrument in these spaces 
while still preserving the privacy of the individuals in the space. What does privacy of the individuals in the space really mean? Um, those are the kinds of questions we would like to ask. The large team of researchers, so this is a project funded by DARPA under a larger umbrella called the Brandeis, so it involves many universities. We are the IoT arm of that project. Um, and this building is a living, breathing space that's going to serve as the test bed for a lot of the instrumentation of those privacy technologies. So we have this physical living, breathing building with a variety of these devices, real people, real activities. You have meetings, you have classrooms, you have lectures, you have seminars. Um, it's a relatively large, uh, deep sense space with lots of things happening if you think about it on a day-to-day, month-to-month basis. We're combining that with Honeywell's um, Enterprise Building Integrator, which is an industrial strength building management system. It's a fairly flexible system that has a nice programmable interface that allows us to put in new technologies. Um, in fact, we, are trying, we have a Siemens building management system in this particular building. We're actually integrating that with what Honeywell provides. You know, there are interesting interfaces to be able to do that. We're also trying out, in addition to this privacy by retrofit type approach, we're starting to build a system from scratch. A privacy by design system that from the ground up that thinks of privacy from each of these different instrumented sensors and what can I do? Is there, what can privacy by retrofit do? What can privacy by design do? And can I get better flexibility and better utility with privacy? With, um, do I really need to think uh, of privacy as a first class citizen from the get go? So to give you some background on this building, we all, many of you have been here. Uh, no, it's a six-story building. It's 90,000 square feet of classrooms, 125 faculty offices, lots of different things going on in this space. Okay? And we have a, a different sets of sensors involved, and I'll come and talk to you a little bit about that a little bit later. So going back to this observe, analyze, adapt loop, right? So in this space, we have diverse sensors. They're used to track objects, entities, people, perhaps events, recognize events. These sensors, from the data, we analyze this data to figure out, hey, there's a meeting going on in this room. Um, the temperature is very high because there's a lot of higher people in this room. Maybe I need to turn down the HVAC. So that's taking these, um, the data that you observe, analyzing them, and using that to actuate, which could be device actuations, which could be data sharing actuations. One of the interesting applications we're building is to think of it as a networked version of Doodle, which essentially says, hey, have all the people who are supposed to come to the meeting, are they already in the room? And is it time for me to go there? Or you know, are there only two people in the room? Can I wait and go 10 minutes later? But that involves me to know where people are and where you are, for example. And that's uh, an interesting example, for example, in this case. So mixing this notion of building-centric data with individual-centric data is useful, as we talked before. But let me give you some simple, walk through some simple examples of how Privacy can be very easily violated in lots of these scenarios. One of the early applications we did earlier on was, you know, uh, the coffee pot is an innocuous place in most places. So we said, okay, can we figure out how many cups of coffee people are drinking? And can we have a rule-based system? It's okay to drink five cups of coffee, but if you go for the sixth cup of coffee, that's when your privacy is disclosed. Can I define these <laughs> policy-based interfaces to determine from the building management perspective when and how, you know, yeah, I sh if, I'm not, if I'm doing something that's regular, my privacy should be protected. So if I take video cameras and I obfuscate the individual, so you know a single sensor here, in this case, discloses the identity. I can do obfuscation, but you know if um, I don't have that, in this case, a simple camera can disclose who you are. I can obfuscate that, but that you'll see later is not necessarily sufficient to disclose privacy. I can tell that it's a man, but if I knew which office that that person came from, and I have some information about the trajectory, I could probably give a good guess as to who that was. Even a simple example, such as a change in HVAC as a result of a person entering a room, right? I'm doing this for sustainability, can tell you, ah, it's Andre's office. It's probably Andre who got in there, and he's been in there for a while. So I can tell you that Andre is in his office just by looking at the change of HVAC, and when he got in, and when he left and how long he spends there, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> this is... I'm so excited about this project. <laughs> <laughs> so, see, this is, this is fairly obvious. Building management systems do that today, right? And so, 
what should we do to protect against that? We do want the benefits of it, but how do we protect against it? It's a good question. It's prevalent everywhere, and it's a question that we scientists should ask. The, you know, a single sensor can do that sort of stuff, but I may use a group of sensors over time. In this case, as I mentioned to you, you know, someone coming out of an office, going to the coffee pot, going towards another building can somehow reveal, for example, who that person might be. Right, so for example, here's a simple example. Let's say uh, the, we ha this project is in partnership with some folks from Cal IT2. So let's assume that you have two events, an event that identifies uh, event one that says, hey, Cal a Cal IT2 researcher, and you know it's a Cal IT2 researcher because maybe they have a badge or an RFID tag that allows them to enter the building. And let's say that you know, uh, E2 is another, is another event which says a tipper's user came into space B. So space A might be the coffee room in Cal IT2. Space B might be the seminar room here in Brent Hall. The knowledge, we know that you know, if there's 30 people who are Cal IT2 researchers, event one tells me it's one out of those 30 people. Event two says oh, there are 20 people in this seminar, so maybe it's one out of 20 in here. If we know that some event was detected, and let's say there are three Cal IT2 researchers who are also on the Tippers project, you know, we know it may be one out of 50, maybe one out of 47, if you know one of those events were detected. If we know both events were detected, we know it's probably one of those three people. And if I know that that researcher had a special badge which says, hey, I'm working on this special project, I know that it's one of my collaborators called Sergio. So there's lots of interesting inferences by the sequence of events that can happen. And these are things that you know are not natural when I think of just you know, falsifying a single sensor data. I have to look at the sequence of events and privacy leak leaks and inferences can happen as a result of this kind of event detection. So knowledge about this, the system state, um, in this case, for as and its evolution can lead to different types of disclosure, okay? Uh, here's another example. I know that, you know, maybe, um, to read two people always, Alice and Paul, always have lunch together. It's about noon, and Paul is in his office, and Alice, you know, Alice, I know Alice went to get some lunch. So I can probably infer that Alice and Paul are in Paul's office eating lunch. So I can infer from the actions of individuals perhaps uh, some knowledge of who's together from background knowledge. The background knowledge here being Alice and Paul typically have lunch together. So the issue is how do I go about even thinking about addressing privacy in this space, given that I have lots of little devices and that they need to be brought in together. So we're looking at uh, different types of um, ways of thinking about this problem. One of the key aspects of this solution is to sort of separate out this notion of entities of interest from actually sensors that capture those entities of interest. So going from this concept of a physical sensor to a virtual sensor to streams of virtual sensors. Um, that essentially allow us to separate out semantics, which talk about people and events and spaces, as opposed to a temperature sensor or an HVAC sensor or a camera. And um, this is one of the building blocks of our approach. We have several others. It gives a natural interface for us to specify privacy policies because policies are not about sensors. They're typically about individuals and events. Um, I won't talk a lot about the architecture, but I'll give you a couple of ideas. There's lots of very interesting aspects of, you know, what can I do if all the data that I'm collecting from the space is being maintained at a server and I'm applying different types of, for example, differentially private techniques to store that data before it's actually stored in that space. What if that data was being held somewhere in the cloud? You know, who do I trust? <coughs> Um, there are trust assumptions, and there, here's where we're looking at some multi-party, secure multi-party computation techniques of how do I encrypt data and perhaps put it in the cloud but be able to still run the kind of queries and applications that I want to run. And there are some other interesting aspects of uh, communication, logging that we're looking at. So these are the two realizations, one of them with the Honeywell system where we're thinking of privacy as a retrofit, and the second where we're developing a new system that is privacy by design. So it's still very early on in the project, so I don't have a whole lot to report about that. Um, here are examples of different types of sensors. Uh, we have infrastructure sensors. We have sensors on mobile phones of users in the space. We have uh, simple instrumented Raspberry Pi uh, IoT sensors. 
Um, we have PCs of individuals that tell you when you're charging your PC and how much energy you've used, for example. Um, this is working with the Cal Club project in Cal IT2. And um, we're able, to, we have a number of events, number of participants that we're looking at. And the key idea, we're looking at two things. One of them is to take all of this data that we're getting and transform it into some sort of presence information. Who is where, maybe even doing what, okay? So how can I transform a combination and fusion of this data into presence information? Can I also extract some information about energy usage in relation to this? If I can have both of these together, what more can I infer than if I could just infer from any one of these types of information? So using these types of um, I virtual sensors or the tables uh, in our uh, data, management, uh, literature, data management terminology, we're trying to build a bunch of applications. One of them is as you enter the building, you'll be able to get better information if you're willing to tell me where you are. I can tell you how exactly to get up to this room, and I can tell you how long it will take for the elevator to get to you. Um, I can tell you, for example, is it comfortable in that room? Would you need a jacket in that room, for example? But I may need to know more about you. So can users give you give privacy preferences, and can I use those preferences in different types of applications? So we are trying to build a Bren Hall concierge application. We have some other information for energy management in these spaces. Um, that can give information about where energy is being used and do I want everyone to know that I have 10 different devices in my office and I'm charging all of them all the time. Uh, um, it's useful to know when I can turn things off for sustainability, but it's also a privacy concern. So um, there are several you know, examples of privacy issues that we have derived from very simple types of sensing and we're trying to address these as time goes by. So this is the larger cluster. We're working with um, um, UMass Amherst, with Duke, with CMU, with a couple of companies as well as part of this project. And here are new other participants that we're working with to enable the understanding of privacy here. Thank you. Thank you. Now I need to go to one of those James Bond stores and figure out devices that scan my office for and taking that stuff out. <laughs> yeah, and prevent them from capturing any information. Okay, exactly. so, thank you. Oh, I should be taking this. Out.